Every place, a village, a town, a city, has a story, its own story, its own history. Maltby, Rotherham, is a town in South Yorkshire with about 16,500 people living there and it was once a mining town. It had a Byford factory built there after the Second World War that made knitwear and a butcher's going back to 1911. But it is the people that make up the community of these places and it is up to us to listen to their stories and share them with the generations to come. I was born here in, well I was actually born in Listerdale, which is just four miles down the road, in maternity hospital, in November 1947. When I was about three or four days old, my, parents, my mother brought me to Maltby, to Tennyson Road, uh, which was my grandmother and my grandfather's house, and I lived there till I was one. Uh, then my parents got their first house on Park View in Maltby, number 52 Park View and I lived there till I was nine, I effectively grew up there and then when I was nine we moved to Manor Road, number 62 Manor Road and I lived there until I left Maltby and joined Navy and when I say left I didn't really leave, I was working away in Navy but Maltby was always my home. From 1911 up to 1930s to start with there were a lot of immigration into Maltby. For example my father or my grandfather who sadly lost his life in the explosion in 1923, he walked from Stoke-on-Trent. Uh, he, he survived battle at Somme in First World War, come home in 1919, met and married the lady who was to become my grandmother, Margaret. Uh, couldn't get a job in Stoke-on-Trent, which is where he lived, uh, in the Potteries, which is where he worked before the First World War. So he, he'd heard about the uh, coal fields expanding in South Yorkshire, so him and quite a few other people walked it from Stoke to Maltby and they got taken on at Maltby Pit, after which he brought his family up and they moved into Cavendish Place. Sadly, two years later, he got blown up, leaving my grandma with the children. Uh, she remarried and had another child, my Auntie Betty, but uh, that was that side of my family, my dad's, uh, my mother's side, they are quite a well-known family in Maltby, the Tozers. They're, uh, if you look in past records, in particular Bob and Jack, my great uncles, they served uh, on Maltby Town Council and were also prominent members at NUM. But my great-grandfather, he moved down from County Durham in 1905 uh, and he moved to Wath, Wath on Dern. And he had eight, eventually he had eight sons and a daughter. All eight sons worked in Mamba's colliery. Uh, and then in 1913, they all moved, with the exception of my great uncle Joe, who had got married and stayed in Wath, they all moved to Maltby. Uh, and they lived up at Back at Stute on Dukes Avenue. Uh, and uh, which then were a new estate and they all worked at Maltby Pit and, and stayed in Maltby forever, you know. In, in fact, there are still Tozers, but they've moved away. I think my mother, who sadly has just gone, was the last... No, there is one more. There is another Toz still living in Maltby. Uh, but the rest on them have, have dissipated, you know. But all them sons all stayed and worked at Pit and died in Maltby. All eight of them. So really, you know, while I took my centre's Maltby, really I'm half Stoke, half County Durham, but I was born here. Uh, and there's a hell of a lot of people in that situation who came, whose forefathers came from far and wide uh, and settled in Maltby because of the work at the pit. I was at grammar school and as a consequence I was supposed to take O-levels, which were real GCs. 
uh, and then A-levels if I wanted to, and then crack on to college or uni or do what I wanted. I was all on the road to take me O-levels, but my mates who went to Maltby Hall Secondary Modern School, they left school at 15 without taking any exams whatsoever until it became comprehensive. And as a consequence, I was still at school in my fifth form while they were now leaving school, or they'd left and were working at Pitt. I was taking papers round for the ultimate goal of 10 shillings a week, which is 50 pence. They were earning six and seven pound a week at Pitt. And as such, to me, they were millionaires and I wanted some of that. Now, whilst the rule, the rule of school where you left at 16 minimum having took your O levels uh, or carried on till you were 18 having done A levels, it weren't law and you could leave if you wanted to, providing you had your parents permission. So I walked in one day, my dad had been on days, coming to the house about three o'clock, knackered. I come home from school about four o'clock, he'd just finished his dinner and he were off for his nap, like I said. And I said, oh, Dad, before you go to bed, I've got something to tell you. And he says, what's that? I said, I'm leaving school. And he looked at me a bit strange, and he looked at my mother, as though to say, has he told you this? And my mum went. I said, I've not told anybody yet, but I'm telling you now. I says, he says, what, what do you mean you're leaving school? I said, I don't want to do my O levels. I said, I want to leave school now and earn money. He says, and pray tell me where you're going to work. I says, at Pitt. I said, I'm going down at Pitt. So he did a wall of death. Now, my dad did the hardest job in Pitt, which were a ripper. Tailgate ripper. There's loader gate rippers and tailgate rippers. Laid tailgate ripper in them days with gun, air gun, as they called it, were by far the hardest job in Pitt, physically demanding, and also most dangerous because of possibility of roof falls and the dust, which causes pneumonosicosis or silicosis, whether it's stone dust or coal dust. So, he did a wall of death, right kitchen, and then he sat me down and he says, do you think I enjoy going down that black hole every day? He says, there are decent jobs at Pitt for a start. He says, I've not got the ability to add two and two and get right answer. He says, that's why I'm doing a ripper's job. He says, I will admit it's good money. He says, but we deserve it. He says, but it's not good for my health. He says, and one day I expect it to kill me. He says, you were at a grammar school, supposedly taking O levels, which you've obviously got the ability to pass, otherwise you won't be there, because we had to pass an exam to get there, called 11 plus. He says, then you've got your choice. You can leave and get a good apprenticeship with O levels, or you can carry on and do A levels and possibly aim at college or uni or do it depending on what you want to do. So I said, right. And I listened to him, uh, but then he went to bed. Uh, but at 15, I knew a lot better than him. We all do, don't we? So next day, instead of putting my books in, I got my uniform on, because we had to wear grammar school uniform. Put my uniform on, waltzed off down to market stall, which is where Tesco's is now, that were an open air market. Uh, and I met my mate Alan, him and I got caught in orchard with. And uh, he says, what are you doing? I says, come in here. He says, what are you doing? I says, I'm getting changed. He says, what into? I says, these. And I pulled my jeans and my t-shirt out of my school bag. I didn't put my books in, I put my clothes in. I says, here's my school. And I scrunched my school uniform into it, into the satchel. I says, you'll look after that and I'll see you back here at four o'clock. He says, where are you going? I says, pit your head. He says, your dad will kill you. And I says, I know, but once I've done it, I've done it. And he'll, you know. Anyway, I walked down to pit yard then, from Tesco, from market stall. And I knocked on, there was a bloke in Mulby called Mr Quarry. He was famous. He was local, he was scoutmaster at 7th of Mulby Scouts and he finished up as district commissioner at Scouts. But he was also the guy you went to see to get set on to start work at the pit. And I knocked on his door and I had come in and I walked in. I said, good morning, Mr Quarry. 
Well, he knew me, obviously, because I was in Scouts. He says, ah, Bill, he says, good morning. He says, could you shut the door on your way out? Your dad's been in. <laughs> and that would end of my pretty career. He wouldn't take me on. I was born on the 17th of April, 1933. My mum worked at Maltby ROF factory. My father was in the army, got called up, was in the army. So in 1940, they were bombing Sheffield. So my grandma got us after bed. Come on, some nasty men are uh, coming, they might drop bombs on the house. Well, I said, I was only young in 1940, so off I went. And the air raid shelters was on Maltby Crags, the air raid shelter that was built, they'd just finished building them. I went in there, and as we were walking up, we could see all the searchlights, and Sheffield were glowing, because they dropped all incendiary bombs. And it was glowing, and we were in the air raid shelter for a while until a man came in and said, you know, it's all clear, so we could go home. But that happened on oh, many, maybe about three or four occasions when they bombed Sheffield. They were after bombing, steel piece and toes because at that time it was the biggest steel works in Great Britain and there were seven chimneys and they called them the seven sisters then when we went to school in, in Maltby school yard was air raid shelter you used to blow a whistle and we used to have to go all go to this air raid shelter put gas masks on this was practice you see in a pit, it's all teamwork, and you never hear much of any arguments, any trouble. If whatever happened, that was it. You know, you could depend on one another. And everybody was, it was 100% teamwork, and it's, it's surprising. You know, and you think, all these thousands of men and that, and the comradeship you got, it was marvellous. I was it was marvellous. I'd I'd just come I'd come back two hundred yards from the tail end down there and I was practically on top of the machine and this man was cleaning out what they called a plough. It used to clean all the dirt, all the coal out so the conveyor could be shoved over, you see. So he was cleaning out to put the plough back in and I'm only a matter from here oh so what? From here to there, off him. And there's such a bump, bang, and a cloud of dust. And I got my shirt, bit well, I had a vest on, put it up to my face because it was that thick with dust. And as the dust settled, Jim Ulliott says, Come here quick, come here quick, there's a man buried under here. I'm trying to think his name. <clears throat> He's buried under here. <clears throat> so we're cleaning out, all we could find was just below his knees. And the slab that dropped on him, it was flat and come out cone-shaped, weighed at least three tonne. And we cleaned out and I had to rig a compressed air gun up to break the big slab up to get him out. It just killed him instantly. And uh, I know a lot went and I just thought, well, a lot went to, you know, as the class was witnesses. But I was there with Jim Mullier because he said to me, you should have been there. You were, me and you were first to him. I said, well, I know it Jim. But it's in the book, and I tell you what, I was like that. It, the first time I really shook up, and I tell you what, it was, it was a terrible experience to find a man buried under about a slab of muck, three, weighing three ton, and he just found his legs. And he went through the Korean War and came back just to get killed. I was born in 1943, August the 13th, on Nutton, Seven Nelson Road, where I lived. And there were my mum, my dad, brother, three sisters, four sisters, sorry, four sisters. And I was brought up there, I attended Maltby Craig School. Uh, until I was 11 and I moved then to Maltby Hall School. I mean, I can remember as a, a young'un where 
all of us were stood at the bottom of Nelson Road because uh, men were buried in pit and everybody waiting for news for them and I can remember that quite vividly uh, and they were waiting for to see what it were and that for us as young as we were sent to bed at seven eight o'clock at night but that had been round about eleven o'clock at night and because everybody were up waiting for news uh, whether they got these blokes out which fortunately they did. What you've got to look at it that is that when I started at Pitt, there would be probably, at that time, there used to be three different school leaving dates. They used to leave at Christmas, they used to leave at Easter, and they used to leave at August. And you would probably have anything up to 70 or 80 lads starting at Pitt each time that the school were leaving, you know, school were leaving. So there'd be 70 on us as young lads starting August when I started. And we all knew each other and, you know, we all worked on all this together. And then when I moved on to Coalface work, you worked as a team and the big thing were, well, you relied each on, on each other for your safety. And so, you know, you, there were no, no really bad feeling and animosity against each other at all. I wouldn't say Maltby were particularly uh, frightened at future because Maltby Pit were... Even at that time, we were sinking third shaft, uh, which were a very big expenditure. I mean, that third shaft that we, we sunk, well, biggest diameter shaft in Europe, um, biggest winding capacity for a shaft in Europe. And so, we knew the investment were going at Maltby. But I mean, what everybody was striking for were well, defence of the fellow workers in other pits that they were going to close. I mean, they'd come along and said, we're going to close caught and wood on economic grounds and so Yorkshire area called a meeting of all branch officials and committee men uh, to Barnsley and we decided that we were going on strike. What, what people don't realise is that police had a lot of agent provocateurs uh, which were people that they used, uh, the, I mean people did, majority of people didn't know what was happening but it was happening and it was very difficult to stop because what they would do they would have people come in dressed in normal clothes and they would start throwing up, throwing up police front back so that it would get police the next year to charge. That was going on fairly regular. I mean, and the, they used to wait at Queen's Corner. And I mean, one experience I had personally was, well, I had a few, but one that stood in my mind was I was walking up High Street up towards where the pet shop is bus stops just that little bit higher up and some some youngsters got off bus young lasses and lads and coppers were all hanging about there and they were being nasty with young uns and they grabbed over a young un to try and pull him in and that just blew up and everybody were having a good place but it was done deliberately it was brilliant. I've got biggest play around the world, I'm not Crags. On my own, I'm Crags. And I used to follow my grandfather down to the Swan. So he put me in front of the fire to go to sleep, so I'd go to sleep. Big coal fire. Oh, it was brilliant, Malvin, in them days. Went to school up top of the hill at Crags School. That's all gone now, hasn't it? I just used to, they'd open the door and I'd gone. Then they'd be looking for me all day. I'd be down at Crags, down Road Chabby. Two year old I'd be down Road Chabby on my own. Uh, or up over at Meadows. My grandfather would be sat up with one of his the door. He's up there again with them cattle. Of course he could see me over at fields over at the top there like. But, but, uh, St John's Ambulance. Scout to Ump Lane and, and uh, Church Hall. That's where Maltby cricket cricket team were uh, based. Uh, then that got turned into Caledonian Club. Just play Peggy on the Sunday mornings down there. Peggy. Peggy. They call it near and spell now. Where you've got a, a a piece of wood about that long. We a fulcrum on and put a, a bobbin on one end, knock it up, and then hit it. Where it landed, then you'd 
other team had said, well, how many strides it going to take you to get to that? Well, you know, let's get bloke with longest legs to stride it out, like, you know, jumping. We'll do it in 30 strides. If you didn't do it in 30 strides, they got 30 points, like, you know. I were, everybody went down there to Fort Boozer on a Sunday, down top at Knob, back at Pitt. Uh, Peggy. That. Very, everybody were there, honestly. Oh, Gala days up on Stoop Fields, there would be hundreds, thousands there, like, you know, Gala day. Gala's, well, they, they tug of war, five a side football, whip it racing, uh, racing round track, and all different things, like, you know, a big beer tent, which they used to stop the night before, so we'd. Uh, <laughs> make a visit <laughs> of a few pints. Uh, a good laugh. Stoop, Stoop told us uh, arranged that like you know, it might be mine as well, sir. They all us arranged Gala Day. And, uh, Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor of Rotherham. I forgot his name now. I forgot his name now. In fact, the last one that they had. Kevin Barron's wife, she went to it and she collapsed and died at it. She had an aneurysm. Kevin's wife, uh, that was the last, last one that they had, like. Last gala that they had. Ah, well, everybody got on in that swan. Even with Odin's. Young ones used to look after Odin's. she get up to go out, you know, and they'd had a good drink. Come on, jump in, car, I'll take the on. That's what it were like, you know, but not now.